Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty wherewith Christ hath made you free. Liberty comes to all of us as some natural thing. And so, what is liberty? The ability to make choices and to be that which you were created to be. And the threats uh, to liberty, only because, you know, liberty comes in two forms, majorly civil and religious. And so you have this entity the Bible talks about that is threatening both. Uh, we talk about it in our studies and the response that God gives to the gospel. And so we welcome you to join us in this interesting Society for Liberty Talks where we'll be examining these things and it will sure be exciting. Hi, welcome to another installment of Society for Liberty. My name is Arnold Ogutu. Uh, and I'm John Seraman. Yes, and we'd like to welcome you in a special way to this episode where we will be getting into the book of Revelation and in particular Revelation chapter 13 and look at the development of the kingdoms of the world and what is happening even right now and what is relevant to us as well. So we'll take you through a lesson of history and we'll be looking at a couple of fascinating things which we encourage you to study for yourself and research um, together with us these things that we will be sharing. So without further ado, I'd like to invite you to join us for Word of Prayer, uh, which will be led by John. John, kindly take us through the Word of Prayer. All right, let's pray. Our Father, thank you for today and this opportunity to consider your word. Um, may it speak to our hearts. Is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. So, um, the book of Revelation, mm -hmm. um, this book was given in the visions that um, the visions that John saw were given in the Isle of Patmos. And um, we know the story of how he got there. Mm -hmm. um, which is in Christian folklore, right? Mm -hmm. um, and there was this emperor who wanted to destroy him. You could tell us more about that. Yeah, so just very briefly, uh, John, uh, the revelator, is actually John the Apostle. Yes. Uh, the youngest of, of all um, uh, of Christ's disciples. And uh, he lives longest and uh, in his old age because of his preaching. He is, um, which is now deemed to be against the empire, um, he is punished uh, by, um, I believe they, they made him blind. Um, uh, they tried to, according now to traditional uh, stories, they tried to throw him into a boiling oil, uh, but miraculously he survived mm. by the intervention of God. It seems that God was not yet finished with his ministry. And so they threw, they threw him to this island in the Aegean Sea called Patmos, uh, a Greek island. It's barren, it's just a rock. Uh, and over there is where he receives his visions. Mm -hmm. Remember, he's blind. Mm -hmm. uh, and he has a scribe who is uh, writing down what he's, he describes to see. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that's how we get, we get the book of, uh, of Revelation. Of Revelation. And uh, the book begins with an interesting introduction that it is the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave unto him to show unto his servants things which must shortly come to pass. Revelation chapter 1 verse 1. And we are told that he sent and signified it by his angel unto his servant John, who bear record of the word of God and of the testimony of Jesus Christ and of all that he saw. So we see that God gives the book in a system that it is the revelation of Jesus Christ which God gave unto him, right? Right. Um, and he sent and signified it. Mm -hmm. Interesting. So signify um, is from where we get terms such as signal, mm -hmm. which tells us of how the book is actually written. And the book is written in signals or symbolic language per se. Now, can you know, um, if, if you want to know that a symbol, a signal is communicating something, someone must actually instruct you 
as regards to what this means, right? Mm. Yes, yes. So some of the signals we know, like traffic signals, mm. as in I remember I had to be taught that green means go, red yeah. means stop, yeah. and orange means get ready. Yeah. So someone has to, if someone is coming up with a set of signals or symbols, mm. then someone has to, the person who has given them has to decide this symbol means this. And this one means this, right? Yes. And we see something like the beast that we are going to see in this discussion, mm -hmm. uh, which we are going to read about in Revelation 13. <laughs> but it is not anything new, dear viewer, from what we see in previous um, prophecies that are given. And God says something very interesting through Hosea, in Hosea chapter 12, verse 10. Mm -hmm. John, you could probably read it for us. <coughs> Hosea chapter 12, verse 10. Right, so yeah. Hosea twelve ten says, I I have also spoken by the prophets, and I have multiplied visions and used similitudes by the ministry of the prophets. So he says, Moreover, I have um you know um just a very fundamental text. Um just allow me to get there. Mm -hmm because I'd like to make reference to it. So the Lord says, I have spoken by the prophets and I, and I have multiplied visions and used similitudes. Mm -hmm. So God says this is his way of communicating when he speaks through prophets. He speaks to them through visions and in these visions he uses similitudes. Now, and these are some of the similitudes that we see like horsemen, like beasts and... Uh, images and all these things, they shouldn't, um, you know, scare us, even if, you know, even when I was still a child and hearing about the seven horse, the four horsemen, and you know, it, one looks like uh, pale, and his name is called death, and it all sounds really scary mm -hmm. until you realize that this is actually uh, coded language, if I mm -hmm. may say, yeah. and when we start studying the prophecies, it's about decoding the symbols for ourselves. So, uh, Revelation also has a structure that it is given in. Um, and you have the one that deals with history. We talked last week about the Great Controversy, which is the overriding theme of the book. And then we, it deals with now current events leading up to the future. So, John... I'd like us to get to Revelation chapter 13, verse 1, which the, the, the reason why Revelation 13, verse 1, dear viewer, is of interest to all of us is that it delineates, it walks us through history and the main powers in the final events of this earth's history and where we are heading. And being that we are talking about liberty, we will see Actually, the book of Revelation prophesying that a time is coming when liberties will be curtailed, not only civil, but religious liberties as well. Mm -hmm. And um, But we have to look at it in the stream of time and see where we stand. So Revelation 13 verse 1, John sees something quite fascinating. What does it say? Yeah, Revelation 13 1 says, And I stood upon the sand of the sea. And so a beast rise up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns, and upon his horns ten crowns, mm. and upon his heads the name of blasphemy. So John sees a beast rising up out of the sea. How do you know when a symbol has been used? Um, well, you have to compare it with uh, the surrounding context. And if it makes uh, sense in its plain reading, then it's not symbolic. But mm. if it uh, if it has reference, like certainly we know there's no living this, animal that, that has ten seven heads, heads, seven and, heads and, and ten horns heads. Yeah. and crowns on those horns. Yeah. So obviously this is a symbol. And th this is a symbol. And uh, let's just begin by decoding that, that symbol of the seven heads. And the Bible explains itself, Revelation 17, verse 9 to 10, where it says, And here is the mind that hath wisdom. The seven heads <clears throat> are seven mountains on which the woman sitteth. And there are seven kings, five are fallen, and one is, and the other is not yet come. And when he cometh, 
he must continue a short space. So, of course, Revelation 17 mm -hmm. is another vision, but the principle underlying the use of the symbols always remains consistent, yeah. right? Yes. And so, mountains symbolize the kingdoms and they are successive kingdoms in the mm -hmm. sense that the beast in Revelation 13 does not have seven heads simultaneously, right? Mm -hmm. It has one head after another because we are told in verse 3 that and I saw one of his heads as it were wounded. So it has one head at a time, which is what we have seen. And we can just make use of uh, a convenient quotation <coughs> by a um, Bible scholar of old, a um, uh, Bible scholar of old called Jen Andrews, um, and in a book called The Three Messages of Revelation 14, 6 to 12, page 41, he said that, it is evident that the seven heads are successive. That is, the beast has but one head at a time. In distinction from the ten horns, which are contemporary, the heads of the beast must, according to Daniel 7, 6, compared with Daniel 8, 22, be explained as kingdoms or governments. Um, mountains, according to Daniel 2, verse 35 and 44, and Jeremiah 51, 25, denote kingdoms. But the version of Professor Whiting which is a literal translation of the text, removes all obscurity from Revelation 17, verse 9 and 10, where it says the seven heads are seven mountains on which the woman seated, and they are seven kings. Thus it will be seen that the angel represents the heads as mountains and then explains the mountain to be successive kings. Thus we see that the angel transferred the meaning from one symbol to another and then gave explanation of the second symbol. Mm -hmm. So, I hope that that is quite... It is. Yeah. It's very clear. The, um, the Bible, as we said, interprets itself. And this is how um, I, um, we're supposed to approach it. Uh, we're supposed to ask God humbly to reveal to us from his word what his word means. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, as we read, I believe last time, that no prophecies of private, private interpretation. interpretation. Yeah. So here we can see very clearly um, that um, this symbol was explained by the Bible itself exactly. only in a, in a, in a different uh, chapter and verse. And the beast has upon his, upon his head ten, ten, ten horns, right? Ten heads and ten, ten horns on. Seven heads and ten uh, horns. Oh, yes. And upon his horns, ten crowns, right? Mm -hmm. Now, it's interesting that crowns denote what? Rulership, mm -hmm. right? And um, you have someone that is very famous in um, very famous in um, what is it called in the science field. Mm -hmm. His name I, Sir Isaac Newton. Sir Isaac Newton, we know him for the three um, the three laws of motion. Mm -hmm. uh, but something that people don't know about his life also is that he was a deep um, Bible prophecy scholar, mm -hmm. and he actually wrote an exposition um, on the prophecies of Daniel and Revelation. Um, so a story said about how after he died, they went to his study, expecting to find, you know, formulas and all these things, <laughs> only to find that there was a Bible there mm -hmm. and there was what he was writing, explanations, and he actually published a book. Now talking about the, the ten horns, mm -hmm. um, and we find this explained also in the book of Daniel chapter 7, verse 24, I believe. Probably we could read it. Mm -hmm. Daniel chapter 7, verse 24. Daniel chapter 7, verse 24. All right, so Daniel yes. 7, 24 reads, And the ten horns mm -hmm. out of this kingdom are ten kings yes. that shall arise. Mm -hmm. So you have... The horns, they, and they generally represent a particular part of what became the ten divisions uh, of Western Rome, which we, is also made reference to in Daniel chapter 2. But we'll talk about this as we talk about the development of this. But I just wanted us to read what Sir Isaac Newton explains really about the ten kingdoms. Mm -hmm. And he says, I have now enumerated the ten kingdoms into which the Western Empire became divided at its first breaking, that is, at the time of Rome's besieged and taken by the gods. 
Some of these kingdoms at length fell, and new ones arose, but whatever was their number afterwards, they are still called the ten kings from their first number. Mm -hmm. So it's a reference to the ten divisions of Western Rome, right? Yes. Now, this is observation upon the prophecies of Daniel and the Apocalypse by Sir Isaac Newton, page 41. And so you have, we could briefly talk about these ten divisions uh, that Rome actually disintegrated as we look at the development of the nations. Mm -hmm. um, so, John, what would you like, you, you could take us through the, you know, how they developed and how we actually walk through it. The ten divisions? Yeah. Well, so Rome obviously was faltering, I believe that's around 4th fourth, fourth and 5th centuries. And um, they, as it was disintegrating, various migratory tribes took advantage of that. And many of them were very warlike. So you had obviously Attila the Han and all these other people. But when Rome now, the Western Empire, because it broke into two, uh, you had the Eastern, which was the Byzantine Empire, and the Western. And as it was now really dying, the Western Empire, mm -hmm. um, the 10 tribes uh, that eventually settled or uh, took spoil of the Roman Empire mm -hmm. uh, became now the 10 great nations of Europe. Mm -hmm. So uh, I believe we, we can see their names yeah. uh, here. Um, we can see Germans, Swiss, all these people, they were migratory tribes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they were barbarians. Um, but we, we can see that there are seven, uh, which means uh, there are three that are not included. I wonder what happened to them. I think we'll talk about that later. Yeah. So <clears throat> this beast, um, uh, we are told in verse 2 that the beast which I saw was like unto a leopard, and his feet were as the feet of a bear, and his mouth as the mouth of a lion, and the dragon gave him his power and his seat and the great authority. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's a composite beast. Yeah. But the interesting thing, dear viewer, is that they, this, these animals that are mentioned, the leopard, the beast, no, the, the leopard, the bear, and the lion, we actually meet them earlier in the prophecies of Daniel, yes, right? Yes, we do. Mm -hmm. And the Bible is here telling us that there is a correlation in, in terms of what is brought to attention as we, as we mentioned in our earlier discussions that a beast represents a kingdom. Right, mm -hmm. but this is a composite beast. Mm -hmm. It it has when you look at it, looks like a leopard, mm -hmm. but it has the it has the mouth of a lion and it has the feet of a bear, and this becomes very interesting. I think when we talked about Nimrod, and we just want to tie in these two things together quite neatly as we move forward, so that we are able to appreciate the big picture and the full picture. So, John, um, you could take us through that aspect. All right. So, yeah, yeah the history is very um, engaging. It's, it's, it's something that I believe every man, woman, and child needs to understand uh, in order to understand the picture of how the great controversy played out on Earth. Um, the last time we spoke, we... So we, we, we discussed concerning um, the fall of Lucifer uh, in heaven, how he became Satan, the adversary, uh, what he did to Adam and Eve, tempting them into sin, and then greatly marrying the image of God in man. And so man became this dysfunctional creature that is tending towards evil all the time. Um, and how that played out in the early days was the confrontation between Cain and Abel, really the confrontation of, of Cain upon Abel, um, and which ended with Cain killing Abel. Mm. And these two people, um, as we spoke about, they represent the two great ways. Mm. Um, there are two great ways, the two kinds of human beings uh, that can exist. And as this goes down in history, you see that there are those who want to do things according to their own will. Mm. So they, they, they are ruled by the principle of self, mm -hmm. uh, and then there are those who are submitting to the will of God. And so um, this led to the flood um, with God because most people had followed after the ways of Cain, and God had to start over again. Mm -hmm. Now, as he st started over again, um, 
again the rebellion springs up. Um, the issue here is um, there is a trace of it that remained. I don't know if I'm sorry if I'm using a movie for a reference, but you've seen these movies where let's say it's uh, okay uh, back in the day in the times of movies um, where there's there's someone who is sick and maybe uh, you try and close the door to keep them out, but some small element of that sickness jumps in into the and infects everyone, right? Yeah, yeah. Maybe a worm or something. And so this is what happened with the flood. Um, unfortunately, Ham, who was the son of Noah, brought those evil tendencies uh, past the flood. Uh, we get this from one of the stories immediately after uh, when um, Noah became drunk yes. and Ham was laughing at him while his two brothers uh, with a lot of sobriety when they learned about uh, Noah being naked, they actually took uh, a piece of cloth and walked backwards so that they would not look at their father's nakedness. Mm. And so again, Ham is continuing this lineage of Cain's mindset mm. because he was he had a weakness in his character. Mm -hmm. um, he was averse to authority. Mm. And so from Ham you get Cush, the son of Ham. And Cush, by the way, is really the person responsible for the building of the Tower of Babel. Mm. Um, when you read, and th there's a, it's, it's an interesting um, uh, interpretation of history when you use words mm. and all that stuff, um, looking at its epitomology, it's called epitomology, mm. I believe, where you're looking at the history of words, etc. You find that um, the person who actually um, led in that uh, rebellion to build the tower was Kush. Yeah. He was known as uh, the son of Ham, uh, which now translates to uh, hermeneutics, okay? Uh, which means the translator, like hermeneutics is uh, the study of words, right? Mm. Um, and so he was the one who translated the languages of men by leading a rebellion. Interesting. So uh, they, it's all interesting um, and, and very, um, um, let me say cordial history, but, um, Obviously, we know the big person after him is his son, Nimrod. Nimrod. And Nimrod is now going to take the rebellion to new heights. Mm -hmm. He's going to uh, begin, as we spoke last time, conquering his neighbors. Mm. He's going to subject people. Remember, people were free. Mm. There were no nations. There was no taxes. Mm. There was no police. You are free for your own pursuits. The only government was the government of God. Mm. And so as long as people were self-governing under God, then they lived in harmony. Mm. But uh, Nimrod introduces uh, the idea of the state mm. and the idea of human government. Um, and, and so, um, and this begins the empire building. And so we begin, as we read in, in Genesis, uh, he, the beginning of his kingdom, Akkad, which is Akkadia, and then you have Ashur, which is Assyria, yes. and all these things. He built Nineveh, he built Babel. Yeah. And so, I think now, that now brings us now to Daniel chapter 2 and Daniel chapter 7. So in, in Daniel chapter 2 and Daniel chapter 7, we'll try to relate them, is that Nebuchadnezzar sees a great image mm -hmm. in his sleep. He can't understand it. Daniel is called to explain. And uh, I would encourage that, you know, we go back after this because because of time we are not able to do a verse by verse exposition of Daniel 2 and then go to Daniel 7 but just to give you a general picture and also we will be able to attach resources below the link of this video so that you can go and read and make reference to some of these um, things and read them in to your satisfaction now he sees a great image whose head is of gold, chest and arms of silver, uh, belly of bronze, legs of iron, mm -hmm. feet part iron, part clay. Yes. Ten toes, basically, five on each side. And this, he told him that you, he told, um, what's his name? Nebuchadnezzar, that you are this head of gold mm -hmm. and after you shall arise another kingdom. And we are able to see that actually, Nebuchadnezzar stood for um, Babylon. Yeah. So Babylon 
was the first world power, right? Not quite, but it's the first world power that comes into contact with God's, God's people. people. Into, and, and that's fascinating because there is a quotation, not, not really a quotation, there is a, this is also an important Bible principle that nations become relevant in Bible prophecy mm -hmm. when they affect or, or when they interact with history mm -hmm. in such a way as to affect God's people, right? Yes, or yes. they affect the history of God's people. So it was not the first. So we see even today very powerful world nations like, like China, for instance, but that doesn't mean we'll now t start and trying to pull them, as we said, that the danger normally in Bible interpretation is mm -hmm. our thoughts, right? So we have, um, John would like to say something about Babylon. Well, yeah, well, Babylon, um, it, 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 it really inherits from Assyria. Um, and and, and um, this is like, I believe, uh, the, in, the, in the time of the Bronze Age and really. And, and so when, when, when he's coming into contact with, with God's people, it is in that part of the world, the premier power. Mm. However, um, Babylon also has some principles that it has developed. Again, um, we are looking at it in the sense that we are uh, we're going to end up with a composite beast or composite nation mm. at, at the end of time, composite kingdom. Mm. So there are certain principles, there are certain characteristics mm -hmm. that are developed under the under the Babylonish kingdom. Mm. So in, in the Bible, um, we get to find, uh, we get a taste of it. We see when God's people interacted with Babylon, what was Babylon standing for? Mm. You, you remember Daniel and his friends? Mm. Um, uh, well, really, his friends, first of all, uh, refusing to bow down to, to the idol. Great. Yes. Right? So um, idolatry. Yes. Mm -hmm. So Babylon introduces to God's people, mm. um, or rather in, in contact with God's people, it, it introduces the principle of idol, idol idolatry. Yes. Idolatry. It pervades. Uh, the Babylonish mind, mm. this thing about idolatry. So in this final kingdom that we're going to see in Revelation 13, mm. we have to see the same element mm. because it's, we're told it has the head of a lion. And according to Daniel chapter 7, mm. the lion is representative of, of Babylon. Babylon. Mm. And also this composite beast we see in Revelation 13 has the feet of a bear. Yes, it does. And we interact with the bear in Revelation, in Daniel chapter 7, mm -hmm. and it is also represented by the chest and arms of silver. So the nation that comes after Babylon is actually the Middle Persians. So um, the Middle Persians, they, they are noted for their cruelty, mm -hmm. and also some of the things they are noted for is the fact that, you know, they were very ruthless, mm -hmm. right? Um, what are some and, of the things here? Yeah. yeah, yeah, and and in they had this. I uh, they introduced this, um, uh, and they still have it, I believe. Um, this as Persians uh, or Iranians, the aspect of the infallibility of the law, or rather, when a king has given out a statement, because a king is representative in their understanding. Of yeah, is 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 the representative of God and earth. When he says something, then it is law. And it is comparable to the law of God. Something like ex cathedra or something yes, like that. Yes, yes. <laughs> I think but we'll yeah. get to that. Yeah. So, yes. so, and then there is an interesting world power. We are told that when you looked at this beast, mm -hmm. it looked like a leopard. Because it says, and the beast which I saw was like unto a leopard. So mm -hmm. its primary trait mm -hmm. was that of a leopard, right? Yes. And we know that we interact with the leopard in Daniel chapter 7, which represent the Grecian Empire. Mm -hmm. And what were the Greeks noted for? It's also the, 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 the waist or the belly of bronze in, which Daniel, chapter in Daniel chapter 2. So, dear viewer, when, when we make these connections, it becomes a very clear picture that also fits with the history of the nations. Mm -hmm. So, John, take us through... What were the Greeks noted for and Alexander the Great mm. and all these people? Yeah, so Greece is, is what, uh, you know, takes over, defeats Persia. They um, basically swallow up 
uh, Persian, the Persian Empire, which was, I think, up until, up until then, uh, one of the largest uh, in history. Mm. And uh, this happens under Alexander. Mm -hmm. But even before we get to Alexander, there's a, there's a development in, in Greece itself, mm -hmm. uh, where um, I think back then they're just known as Ionians, um, where they, 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 they become, um, they, they, they develop a string of Greek thought, yes. which is really philosophy, yes. uh, beginning with as far back as people like, uh, I think, Archimedes, uh, he was more of a philosopher than a mathematician. And Archimedes, yeah. Uh, no, no, no. Uh, no. Which one? I'm forgetting his name. Then. <laughs> okay. Well, you can just say what he did. All those Greek names are hard. So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> but, but you have, eventually, it matures under Plato, uh, or Plato, um, with his philosophy. His main thing was the theory of forms, uh, which is really spiritualism. Mm. Um, and, and, and his student, uh, uh, Aristotle, Mm. Uh, and by the way, Aristotle is now the one who actually schooled mm. Alexander. So there's, there's Greek philosophy developing. Mm -hmm. And again, philosophy uh, goes along with culture mm -hmm. because there's, there's a culture developing. Remember, Greece is the birthplace of democracy mm. and all these ideas. But also you had open homosexuality. You had all these interesting things in Greece going on. So Greece is known for its philosophy and it's culture. And education and it's as well. A, yes, it's so, education. So how Greece actually enslaved the world was not so much through... The force of arms. The force of arms, mm -hmm. but it enslaved the minds of people because Greek thought pervades to this very day. Yeah. yeah. Interesting. Mm -hmm. Now, um, so more about why is it that this final beast that we see, this composite beast, mm -hmm. is primarily leopard-like, actually tells us its character. Now, um, then we have the nation that, that follows is actually a nondescript beast mm -hmm. with, with also 10 horns, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. And um, you have it with the also corresponding with the, the, the feet, no, the, the legs that are of iron as well. Mm -hmm. So Rome enters the scene. Now Rome is very... It's different. It's different. It's it's a different animal. It's it actually, actually, I'd like us to read it. Yeah, okay. Daniel chapter 7, verse 7. Daniel chapter 7, verse 7. Daniel chapter 7, verse 7. All right. So, yes. I'll read. Daniel 7, 7 says, mm -hmm. After this, I saw in the night visions, and behold, a fourth beast, dreadful and terrible and strong exceedingly, and it had great iron teeth. It devoured and break in pieces and stamped the residue with the feet of it. And it was diverse from all the beasts that were before it. And it had ten horns. Now we see also the, the, the spirit of God drawing that connection. Mm -hmm. The iron teeth corresponding to the iron legs. Yes. Which tells us that it's responding to the same. It is referring to the same power. But we are also told that it was diverse from mm -hmm. all the beasts that were before it. What made it so special? Yeah, so a number of factors. Um, Rome is really, um, it's, it's the longest existing uh, nation, we might say, because it's still there till today. Mm -hmm. um, so Rome uh, begins as a nothing, like a backwater. Um, there are obviously interesting stories there about mm -hmm. uh, Ro Romulus and Remus, but as, as it becomes a regional power, mm -hmm. um, obviously it was a republic uh, after throwing off the kings. So in that sense, it was different from the other nations which were monarchies. Yes, it, and, and again... And Rome was a republic. Rome was a republic. Mm -hmm. they, um, and you'll see this history repeated mm -hmm. later on in Revelation 13. Mm -hmm. They rebelled against kings and set up a republic. Mm -hmm. And a republic is not a democracy. Mm -hmm. A republic is a democracy of laws, mm -hmm. not, not of men. So what, what I mean is they had a constitution. And the constitution was called 12 tables. They had a system of law. And obviously when you have law and order, people are going to prosper. The country is going to be great. Mm -hmm. And Rome was different because it, it, um, um, 
it 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 grows in a different way than others it, it the idea of a carrot and a stick mm-hmm. at the same time so uh, maybe we'll talk about that later but uh, just for the moment i would say that rome was different because the their system of government their form of government was, was completely different different from what had come before yes now back to a clear understanding of why we see john saying and the beast which i saw was like unto a leopard and his feet was the feet of a bear and his mouth as the mouth of a lion then there is another interesting element here that the dragon gave him his power and his seat and great authority mm-hmm. now we know that primarily the dragon represents satan uh this we find in revelation chapter 12 uh verse we would just like to give that proof text revelation chapter 12 verse 9 where it says and the great dragon was cast out that old serpent called the devil and satan which deceived the whole world he was cast out into the earth and his angels were cast out with him mm-hmm. but now that so the the symbol of the dragon primarily represents satan yes correct mm-hmm. however we see in certain places like in revelation chapter 12 mm-hmm. Um, in Revelation chapter 12 where it says uh, in verse 3 and there was and there appeared another one in heaven and behold a great red dragon having seven heads and 10 horns and seven crowns upon his heads and he still drew the third part of the stars of heaven and did cast them to the earth and the dragon stood before the woman which was ready to be delivered for to devour her child as soon as it was born now this a woman representing um a woman representing a church a church mm-hmm. and we find that in jeremiah chapter 6 verse 2 mm-hmm. compared with jeremiah isaiah chapter 51 verse 13 so in this context when jesus is being born mm-hmm. because we find evidence in verse 5 that this child is actually a reference to jesus christ mm-hmm. Now when this child is being born there is someone who actually wants to destroy him mm-hmm. right and uh, this someone is Herod mm-hmm. so we find that the bible uses this symbol in a primary and in a secondary sense as well i like us to read uh, Ezekiel 29 verse 3 and then we can talk about the in a secondary sense what does this symbol represent because we see that this composite beast receives its seat its power its authority mm. from the dragon so yeah what does Second. it say 29 verse 3 it says speak and say thus say the lord god behold i am against the pharaoh king of egypt the great dragon that lies in the midst of his rivers which has said my river is mine own and i have made it for myself so we see also egypt being referred to as a dragon mm-hmm. so what is the what is the idea that god is trying to communicate to us through the use of the symbol of the dragon for secular nations like in the sense of herod herod was under rome mm-hmm. at the time and here we see also what will you say about that so the f- the first pointer is is back in daniel chapter 7 when we are told like this is a a, a beast that um daniel couldn't describe mm-hmm. and the fact is it's because it's a beast he 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 couldn't compare it with anything that he knew mm-hmm. and so quite clearly that fits the idea of a dragon mm-hmm. um and uh, the second point would be that as you've said in um uh, revelation 12 uh, there is the dragon is responsible for attempting to kill uh, christ upon his birth but the 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 agent of that mission was really uh, king herod who was a client king of rome mm. so rome was behind and he was using roman soldiers yes so rome was behind the attempt to try and kill uh, christ yes. so the conclusion would be that uh, as you've said there's a primary and a secondary sense uh, you have the devil behind these nations that are secular that and are secular atheistic in a sense because you have egypt as well yes yeah, and yeah. and and he's 
he's pushing an agenda, but he cannot do it openly. He mm. has to use the mask of these empires. Mm. And he's been building towards a certain crescendo, a certain end, a certain high point, where he's going to now unveil mm. his master project. Interesting. And uh, we see that, and upon his head's the name of blasphemy. Mm -hmm. What is blasphemy? Well, blasphemy, I, I'd use the biblical uh, definitions yes. where when someone claims to be God, mm. it is blasphemy. Uh, so we have two things here. Mm -hmm. We have a beast, um, and we find that in Mark 2, 7, we find that also in John chapter 10, verse 30 to 33. But dear viewer, follow with us that the beast represents a political kingdom. Mm -hmm. But we are seeing that it has a religious element in the sense that blasphemy, by definition, is a human being or an earthly power assuming divine prerogatives mm -hmm. among them, the ability to, to um, forgive sins, mm -hmm. right? So that, that is already giving us a clue that now the system that takes over from Rome like is Rome's successor because we are told the dragon gave him his power and his seat and great authority. Mm. The system that takes over from Rome, which is which was pagan, is now you have this religio political system mm. um, in, in that in that sense. Now, when we look at the early Christians, the the apostles, it seemed like they had a sense in how they were writing, they had a sense that. There was a system that was coming after the decline of Rome. After the decline of Rome. Mm -hmm. It's like they had the sense. For instance, we have Paul the Apostle in Acts chapter 20, verse 28 to 30. And he says, giving his benediction, he says, Take heed therefore unto yourselves and to all the flock over which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers to feed the church of God which he hath purchased with his own blood. For I know this that after my departing shall grievous wolves enter in among you, not sparing the flock. Also of your own selves shall men arise, speaking perverse things, to draw away disciples after them. Mm -hmm. So you remember when, um, when uh, Barnabas was preaching to the disciples at Antioch and telling them that they should cleave to the Lord. That was the message of the disciples. Mm -hmm. But now we have men arising who are drawing disciples after them they want to be the ones to be to be followed mm -hmm. and so we have an issue of an ecclesiastical system that now wants to take the place or to use up the place that actually belongs to the lord let me let me briefly yes. comment just quickly on that yeah um we began this by elaborating the the fall of lucifer yeah and this so-called mystery of iniquity mm. is now, uh, with the history we've covered, mm. is now coming to the foreground. It has been taking shape with what we've seen uh, from Babylon, from, from Persia, from Greece, the various elements that were developing through those histories. Now they are coming together in this mystery of iniquity mm. to form this final power. Yeah, and you've just mentioned mystery of iniquity, and we find this term in... Second Thessalonians chapter 2, I'd like us to just quickly run through it from verse 1 to 7. Second Thessalonians chapter 2, from verse 1 to 7. So I'll just read it um, briskly. It says, Now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, and by our gathering together unto him, that ye be not soon shaken in mind, or be troubled, neither by spirit, nor by word, nor by letter as from us, as that the day of Christ is at hand. Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come, except there come a falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition. Mm -hmm. So there will be an apostasy among God's people yeah. after the disciples, because Paul says in Acts 20 that I know after my departing shall grievous wolves come, mm -hmm. and they shall draw people, they shall speak perverse things, probably blasphemous things, mm -hmm. drawing disciples after them. And then he says, this son of perdition, this man of sin, 
who opposed and exalted himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped, so that he as God seated in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Mm -hmm. Isn't this blasphemy? It is. It is. And this is the religious political power that they were seeing coming after the fall of Rome. Mm -hmm. Interestingly, he says, Remember ye not that when I was yet with you, I told you these things. And now you know what withholdeth that he might be revealed in his time. What is this that was a restraining influence? It was the Roman state. Exactly. Mm -hmm. So at the fall of the Roman Empire, this final power, this final mysterious evil power was mm -hmm. going to be revealed. Interesting. For the mystery of iniquity that already work, he says uh, very fascinatingly that for the mystery of iniquity that already work, only he who now let it will let until he be taken out of the way. Mm -hmm. So the only thing that was preventing this religious political power from taking the place of, um, of Rome mm -hmm. to now entrench itself in that place conveniently and take that place was the Roman power, mm -hmm. the, the, the pagan Roman power. And there's an interesting quotation about how um, this system developed, which I'd like us to read from an interesting book called Great Controversy. We'll put um, a link to that book also below this video for your reference as well. When the early church became corrupted by departing from the simplicity of the gospel and accepting heathen rites and customs, she lost the spirit and power of God. And in order to control the consciences of the people, she sought the support of the secular power. The result was the papacy, a church that controlled the power of the state and employed it to further her own ends, especially the punishment of heresy. And so you have this system, mm -hmm. the papal system, entrenching itself, Roman in all, in all its faces, mm -hmm. developing almost naturally, I would say, because initially you have five great centers of Christianity. Mm -hmm. You have Alexandria, mm -hmm. you have Rome, you have Antioch, you have Jerusalem, and you have Constantinople. Mm -hmm. So you essentially have the bishops in all these places, they're all the same rank. Mm -hmm. But because there's one who is in the capital, all of a sudden, you know, when it says the dragon gave him his power, his seat and great authority, what, was, what is it that's happening here in terms of transfer of the seat and this kind of thing? Mm, so, uh, well, maybe I can mention that, first of all, Rome had always been a union of church and state. Even though it was a republic, um, it was always that so because you had religion entrenched into the, the civilian uh, system. Mm. Um, and, and so what happens is, uh, that Roman state mm -hmm. does not really die. It only switches over now from uh, the state controlling the church to now a church controlling the state. So you literally have a nation masquerading as a church. Exactly. And, and so uh, when we're talking about when the Bible reads that he gave him his seat, his uh, power and great authority, uh, this is in reference to, um, was it Justinian? Yes. Uh, who uh, e evacuated Rome and left the names, the vestments, um, all the titles of the Caesars mm -hmm. uh, to the Bishop of Rome, and mm. including the armies, mm. of course. And so, and he named the Pope, or rather back then he was called just the Bishop of Rome. Mm. He named him um, the Corrector of Heretics. Mm. So, and uh, I'd just like us to read this quotation from, uh, from um, the rise of the medieval church, page 168, 169, where it says that the removal, actually it was Constantine who moved his capital mm -hmm. from Rome to Constantinople yes, yes. Mm -hmm. and left this vacuum. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden, this bishop is being asked, why not deal with also not only the religious disputes between the Christians, mm -hmm. but their civil disputes. Yeah. Then all of a sudden, He's being told to deal with the civil disputes of everyone. And the moment that the, 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 the moment that Rome disintegrates as a result of the attacks by the barbarian tribes, mm -hmm. then all of a sudden you have this bishop in Rome who is now 
not only a religious leader but he is a caesar mm -hmm. he is basically so it was a natural process mm -hmm. so it says the removal of the capital of the empire from rome to constantinople in 330 left the western church practically free from imperial power to develop its own organization the bishop of rome in the seat of the caesars was now the greatest man in the west and was soon forced to become the political as well as the spiritual head mm -hmm. so this was a fact of history and it says to the western world rome was still the political capital hence the whole habit of mind all ambition pride and sense of glory and every social prejudice favored the evolution of the great city into the ecclesiastical capital mm -hmm. civil as well as religious disputes were referred to the quote and quote success of peter for settlement again and again when barbarians attacked rome he was compelled to actually assume military leadership eastern emperors frequently recognized the high claims of the popes in order to gain their assistance it is not difficult to understand how under these responsibilities the primacy of the bishop of rome established in the pre constantine period was emphasized and magnified after the 313 edict of milan mm. so that's the history behind it yeah let, let, let me put a bit of a, a verse mm. to try and contrast with how god uh, viewed this development so in the book of matthew um matthew chapter 22 just very briefly mm -hmm. um the, this is towards the end of christ's ministry and and they the pharisees they have planned how they are going to entrap jesus and they come and ask him a question about taxes they ask uh, should we pay taxes uh to uh this is uh, matthew 22 um verse 17 Mm. perhaps i know you can read yeah so it says tell us therefore what thinkest thou is it lawful to give tribute unto caesar or not so, But, yeah. so it's a, it's, a, it's a trick question if he says yes uh they they are going to accuse him of selling out the jewish nation yeah and if he, if he, if he says, says no, no they're going to accuse him to the romans that he's telling people not to pay taxes so they can accuse him of sedition yes uh -huh. so it was a in their eyes it was a no win situation but we can read of Christ's reply but Jesus perceived their wickedness and said why tempt ye me ye hypocrites show me the tribute money and they brought unto him a penny and he said unto them whose is this image and superscription and they said unto him caesar's then said he unto them render therefore unto caesar the things which are caesar's and unto god the things that are gods exactly so it's it's a perfect reply um where christ was able to see into their motives mm -hmm. and um answer it correctly so what christ has done here really um he has asked them um he has laid out a principle mm. that there has to be a separation between the things of god and the things of civil government mm. so they are this this idea of like when he says render to caesar the things that are caesar's and, and to god gods. the things that are god mm. essentially christ is saying caesar is not god mm. that's point number 1 and point number 2 he's saying there are things that belong to caesar and there are things that belong to god when you go to romans 10 you realize caesar can deal with the last six commandments romans 13 yeah. but he, if he touches the first four then it's a problem because mm. those ones belong to god mm. and so um essentially here Uh, in correlation to what has happened with the history and how the bishop of rome saw this as an opportunity to become a civil leader he was violating this principle that christ had laid out yes. that the things of god are to be separate from mm -hmm. the things of this world interesting and so you have the the, the development of the medieval church right mm -hmm. and one thing that i want to take us back to is that the system that is being spoken of in revelation 13 that is blasphemers looks like a leopard has been identified and only one um kingdom actually fits it which mm -hmm. is actually the papal power mm -hmm. and um just we would like to show you a video um about just an explanation of why is it that greek philosophy is the foundation of um of this kingdom of the papal system 
Um, and this one was prepared by a Bible expositor whom the entire vision we will um, will share it also will place a link in this video for you to go and watch the full uh, documentary but we just wanted you to see it was done by Christopher Hudson uh, which is just uh, an excerpt where an explanation is given based on research and based on visiting some of these places for you to be able to appreciate. So. So you may be wondering, how exactly are we going to figure out what principles or practices or even ideologies that the Greeks were notorious for have today been adopted by the papacy and are practiced very prevalently within the ranks of Catholicism? It's an easy question to answer. All we have to do is go to the very same source from which we've drawn the rest of our answers, the Bible, the living word of God. You see, in the book of Acts, chapter 17 and verse 20, when Paul was in Athens, which, by the way, at that time was a part of the territory of Greece, he said that all the Athenians and strangers that were there spent their time in nothing else but either to tell or to hear something new. So in other words, the Greeks were people that loved to engage in human philosophy. They loved to exalt human reasoning. And then in Acts, chapter 17 and verse 21, when Paul stood up, to address this multitude of Athenians, he said, Ye men of Athens, I perceive that in all things ye are too superstitious. Superstition was something that was ingrained within the culture of the Greeks. They were a people that were caught up in paganism. So the only question that remains is this. Is the Roman Catholic Church a system of worship that exhausts the philosophy the human reasoning of men above the living word of God, the Holy Bible, and have they adopted original pagan practices within their religious belief system and have retitled it Christianity for the masses? If you're not sure, you're getting ready to find out. Right now, we're in the Basilica of San Clemente. And if you're not sure that Roman Catholicism is nothing more than paganism revived and dressed up in Christian garments, then you need to visit this place because what you're going to find out here at the Basilica of San Clemente is that this so-called Christian edifice was built on top of a structure where the pagans would come and worship their patron god Mithra, the sun god. And not only that, but the Christians ended up fusing in their worship system paganism and what you have is nothing more than an amalgamation between Christianity and paganism. So the Bible is clear and very precise in identifying Roman Catholicism as a cult mystery worship revived in a system of worship that professes to exalt Jesus Christ. It is astounding what you'll find right here in the Basilica of San Clemente. This stone artifact located within the ruins of the Temple of Mithra. You'll notice this carving of a decorated evergreen tree. It's known as the Sarve or the Rocket Juniper. It was erected to pay homage to the birth of Mithra during the time of the winter solstice in the month of December. Children would decorate this tree with their wishes that they would wrap up in colorful pieces of silk cloth and then hang them on this tree as offerings to the sun god Mithra. 
In 353 AD, Pope Julius I authorized that during the winter solstice, a time which was previously reserved by the pagans for the celebration of the birth of the sun god Mithra, should now on December 25th be a time to celebrate the birth of Christ. Hence, the emergence of the Mass of Christ or Christ Mass. Though partially marred, you can clearly see on this wall of the temple ruins of the sun god Mithra two solar wheels. These solar wheels have eight spokes. They're symbolic of the eight solstices, one of which being the solstice of winter, which was known as Yule. This is where we get the phrase Yuletide greetings from, which people use during the Christmas season. Interesting enough, in the Basilica of San Clemente, located just above these pagan ruins, you can find the very same solar wheel that was used in the worship of the sun god Mithra. But what's even more astounding is the puzzling fact that the largest solar wheel that is known to be in existence is found right in the midst of St. Peter's Square, which is the seat of the papacy, the sovereign governing authority over the Roman Catholic Church. So, um, dear viewer, that was just, uh, you know, a snippet of how deeply ingrained within, this is why Daniel, this is why John said, and the beast which I saw was like unto a leopard. It's basically built upon Greek philosophy. Mm -hmm. John, would you like to say something in that regard? Well, I, I believe the video has, has kind of clarified, even though it's, it's a few uh, points of fact, but you can see that it's, it's, it's pervasive uh, in, the, in the vestments, in the clothes, um, even with things like uh, the fish mitres, mm -hmm. which was really something to do with um, the fish god mm -hmm. in pagan times. And, and so uh, when, when, when pagan Rome uh, was, was, was collapsing, really, mm -hmm. uh, both the, the, the pagan Roman state and the pagan Roman religion, mm. which now had amalgamated the Greek culture and philosophy and religion, um, just moved into the, the church. Mm. And, um, you know, now as even uh, the presenter there has said that um, it, it just wore Christian garbs yeah. Yeah, and baptized paganism. So um, some sobering facts. Interesting. And it's, it's, it's not something new, brothers and sisters, in the sense of even the early reformers like Martin Luther, they identified this system as the one that was being referred to in the visions of John and Daniel as the anti-Christian power. Just to consider a few quotations, I, Luther said, I know that the Pope is the Antichrist and that his seat is that of Satan himself. The papacy is a, is a general chase by command of the Roman pontiff for the purpose of running down and destroying souls. John Calvin, who founded the Methodist, is it? No. The Calvinists. The Calvinists, mm -hmm. rather. He was a very influential um, reformer. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So he said that we call the Roman pontiff Antichrist mm -hmm. because they had seen within this element. Now, just to clarify, Antichrist does not mean against in the Greek sense. It means in place of usurper. What Paul talked about when he says, then shall be revealed the man of sin who opposeth and exalted himself above all that is called God, so that he as God sitteth in the temple, such as he is worshipped. Mm -hmm. And this is the same idea that Satan has continued from heaven and is now using this system to basically turn the attention of people from Jesus to man, right? Mm -hmm. Now, he, John Wesley, who founded the Methodists, said that he is, in an emphatic sense, the man of sin, as he increases all manner of sin above measure. John Knox, the thundering Scot, mm -hmm. who Mary Queen the of Scottish. Scots mm -hmm. once famously said, I fear the prayers of John Knox <laughs> more than all the armies of England combined. Mm -hmm. And he said that the Pope should be recognized as the very Antichrist. Now, just as we want to wrap up today's uh, episode, we find that we are told that, and there was also something else that characterizes this system, is that it has a mouth that speaks great things and blasphemies. Mm -hmm. Now, we'll just use a few quotations. 
This was Pope Leo XIII in an encyclical letter in June 20, 1894. He said that we hold upon this earth the place of God Almighty. I mean, how more blasphemous can you get? Um, and uh, you have Pope Pius V who said the Pope and God are the same. Mm -hmm. So he has all the power in heaven and on earth. Uh, also quoted in the New York Catechism, the Pope takes the place of Jesus Christ on earth, Antichrist, mm -hmm. in place of Jesus Christ. And Pope Nicholas I said that the Pope who, being God, cannot be judged by, by man. Being God. All right. So um, this was something that was in the Time magazine which talked about why being Pope means never having to say you're sorry. Mm. Um, so the first C, this is canon law. So canon law is what governs? Yeah, it's, it's the internal, like, um, it's like church manual, if you may say something. For, like for the Roman for the, Catholic yes. Church. Mm. So it says that the first C is judged by no one. The Roman pontiff, pontiff to whom the words prima sedes apply cannot be judged on earth by any human power. And here we have him sitting on the great white throne, surrounded by cherubims. And so, I don't know how much more blasphemous it can get, but what is clear is that um, this system is actually the one that is that fits the prophecy of Revelation chapter 13. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and we invite you to take your time and... Um, review these things that we have reviewed today so that we are able to see together the fact that God's word is dependable and God's word gives us direction on where we are headed, where we are in the stream of time because we will be looking in subsequent presentations at um, Father, what role the, the, this system has to play mm -hmm. in the final events because it is a gigantic system mm -hmm. and having a hold upon many things in this um in this world as we know it so john would you like to say a few closing words yeah uh maybe first of all we can say that this is not a, a catholic bashing um uh, you know we don't delight in any of that but there it's it's about facts um and first of all the history is undeniable uh, the connectivity with biblical interpretation also is is just beyond uh, reproach and um and and as we've seen it's a there's a history of great christian men uh, who have come to these conclusions as well so um this is not to impugn the character of any catholic or anything mm. but it's it's an issue of systems remember mm. this began with uh, nimrod and all these things so it's it's an issue of systems which are designed to eventually snuff out civil liberties, but of course the religious. end goal is religious liberties, mm. so that uh, those who believe in God, remember, those who follow after the ways of Abel can mm. be forced to follow after the ways of Cain. Yes. And so, I don't know, uh, based on what we've covered so far, um, I would invite us to, you know, um, have full confidence in God's word that having predicted with exactness the past kingdoms and also the present, are we able to entrust him with our future as well, as well as our present, and to surrender our lives to him and allow him to take control of our lives. That is my prayer for myself, for my friend John, and for all of us as well, may God bless you. And we look forward to having you join us in the next episode of Society for Liberty. May God bless you. Let us pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for this Father that you've brought us, the things that you've revealed to us. We pray that your spirit may come into our hearts and help us to investigate these things and finding them to be so, to have confidence in you in your word and in the promises that you've given us whereby you tell us that by these promises we become partakers of the divine nature having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust we pray that you may keep our listeners 
keep everyone who has made time to listen to this discussion and we pray that your spirit may guide us all even as we seek to study further and to determine what is your will for our lives and to follow it by your spirit. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Please like and share our videos. To be notified when they come out, subscribe.